That's actually an interesting question because I think many people don't understand uh, how computing actually began at Waterloo and why it became dominant so quickly and who was responsible. And it's not a straight line, as I guess most things in history are not. Um, it begins with the arrival of a professor in mathematics from the University of Toronto by the name of Ralph Stanton, who was hired by what was then Waterloo College. The key player in the beginning is going to be Ralph Stanton, and he comes from U of T, but he also brings with him significant numbers of graduate students, one of whom would be Donald Cowan, who ends up becoming the first um, chair of the Department of Computer Science at Waterloo, uh, who comes here entirely because of Stanton. The other man who came to Waterloo because of Ralph is a man called Wesley Graham, J.W. Graham or Wes Graham. And Wes Graham was a, had done a coursework at U of T and had studied with Stanton. And he had gone on to work for IBM where he had become um, a project leader at IBM in Toronto. And so he knew computers inside out. And he talked to Stanton and said, you know, I, I'd be interested in coming to a, a new university to teach in the Department of Mathematics. And so Stanton said, well, yes, please, please come, because he knew Graham to be a really uh, brilliant student. And Graham came and was uh, a lecturer in mathematics. And that, at this point in time, they had begun to think about having a computer, not a computer science department, but a department that involved with computing, and it was going to be in, a, in electrical engineering. They were building computers, not writing software. They wanted to make a computer and then try to make it work. And that's what U of T was doing too. I think the model was a Unix. Anyway, what happened was they put uh, a very, very prominent engineering professor by the name of Basil Myers in charge of the computer project at Waterloo. But um, there was a change in dynamics because Basil Myers got frustrated with Canada and he got very frustrated with the kind of lack of grants that he could acquire in Canada, and building computing was expensive. So he went back and left the computing as a director, and Stanton at this point suggested that maybe Wes Graham, because of his knowledge of computing from IBM, would be a reasonable choice as the new director. A turning point, if ever there was one, for the University of Waterloo. That, you know, we often talk about timing. The timing was just right. And the personality was just right. And Graham had just come back from Toronto and was not interested in an academic career as a publishing scholar, but a more practical application of computing. And um, so that's really important. I, I always think that's one of the great turning points. Now, lots of stories about this and lots of theories, but basically, Graham said, why are we building a computer when you can buy one from IBM for you can lease it and you can buy it? There's no point in building another computer. So he shifted the direction of computing at Waterloo from building a computer to leasing them from IBM. And then leasing them from IBM and then determining how to write the software that will make the computers more efficient. And this becomes the, uh, the leitmotif at the University of Waterloo. Waterloo would do what the others weren't doing rather than replicating what every other university was trying to do. There is this idea that computers are about that computers are something that are important and that everybody should be able to use them effectively and efficiently and do something interesting with them. Uh, Waterloo was very early in, in the 60s with the idea that not you know, the computers weren't just for physics students or for um, for computer science students or math students or engineers that that art students or uh, like literature majors or philosophers they could also use a computer not not just to write essays but maybe there were applications there were people writing early concordances and indices and dictionaries and that's one of the big reasons i guess for uh, Waterloo, I mean, eventually came to help digitize the Oxford English Dictionary. And then the, the software and the techniques that were developed there became OpenText, one of the 
biggest spinoffs ever to come out of the university. What Graham had in mind was, and it's often said, and I'll, I'll repeat it, but he, the, his phrase ultimately became, he wanted computers to be as common and used as, as easily by students as a pencil and a piece of paper. And he wanted every student to be able to use a computer at Waterloo. That simply was unheard of because at a university like uh, Toronto, only the most senior professors had access to computers. Certainly junior professors did not. And students absolutely were, were uh, totally outside of the pale. A, it was very expensive. And B, it was very inefficient. But it became part of what they said students coming out from Waterloo would be computer literate. And that became part of the uh, mystique of Waterloo. <laughs> There were other universities with very similar problems of having a lot of students to teach how to program um, on the order of several hundred or even thousands of students a term to learn how to program. And the standard IBM compiler or the standard compiler for any computer of the day tended to be fairly slow. It might take 10, 20, in 30 minutes to, to run a single program. So the, the common method of processing a lot of student programs was everybody submitted them in a, in a great big batch. The computing center, I don't mean at Waterloo necessarily, but, but at other universities, they would process all of these programs at once, uh, maybe overnight or over the course of a few days. And you might get the results back within a few days or even a week. It would, to run your program once might take a week after having written it and punched it onto punch cards, submitting it, and then you walk away and that was that. You might not see it again for, for a few days. So this sort of programming cycle is time consuming and you're, you're not getting a really good intuitive sense of what it's like to program or what a what a good program is or how to write one quickly or efficiently. So universities have a bit of a problem. They need to teach hundreds of students and they can't wait half an hour for every student. So a lot of them in the early 60s are working on this same problem of a student oriented and a fast compiler. So a compiler that gives useful debugging messages and diagnostic messages and compiles very, very quickly. And by this time, a number of young students were, they were going in the, in the, uh, the computing, the computer was set up in the physics building, it's physics and mathematics building. And they sneak in at lunchtime and uh, write programs on the computer. And one of the stories of how they got in was simply popping the ceiling tile on one side of the door, ceiling tile on the other side of the door, so they could pop the tile, crawl over, pop the other tile, and get in. And they were in there busy <laughs> playing with the computer, and they were teaching themselves how to do it. But anyway, Wes Graham caught them and said, boys, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're programming. Well, what they were actually doing was playing music on the computer, <laughs> making it make music and so sounds. But they, they learned how to uh, write um, so early programming, they taught themselves how to do it. And he said, that's pretty interesting. Why don't you, why don't you just carry on? And uh, he gave them permission. They were actually running little programs to do their um, equations in mathematics as well. So they were actually using it in an applied way in undergraduate courses themselves, not sharing with the other students, but doing it. And um, so that would be about 1964 or five. In the summer of 65, Wes Graham proposed to four of these students, Jim Mitchell, Gus German, Richard Shirley, and Bob Zarnke, that they might be hired to write a, a, a compiler that would improve on the Forgo compiler, which wasn't very effective. Over the course of one summer, four undergraduate students wrote a new compiler called the Watt 4 compiler. And um, it was so efficient that uh, it was about 100 times faster than IBM's own uh, compiler they were using in Toronto. Because Wes 
called his friends at the IBM office in Toronto and said, I've got this new uh, compiler. C can we bring these four young guys in and show it to you? The IBM story, uh, according to Jim Mitchell, is they were pretty indignant and pretty huffy. And they put their program through and it went, do it, do it, do it. And then they ran the, the Watt 4 compiler these students had wrote and went, Brr, and it's done. And they couldn't believe it. But suddenly they realized they had a, a something that was incredibly useful for all universities. So suddenly Waterloo is famous, and that's when the the idea of Waterloo and computing becomes synonymous. In the meantime, because we now have a relationship with Honeywell, we've had this long-standing relationship with IBM. There's another major computer company called DEC, and DEC want to become part of the computing scene at Waterloo too. And so they agreed in, I think it's about 18, 1983, to donate um, $23 million worth of computers, including the big VAX computers. And once again, the, the issue came up over, well, who controls? If you create new software using the DEC system, do they own it or does the university professors who work on it own it? And Dex said, no, if we're giving you $23 million worth of computers, our computers, we own it. And the story that's fascinating, which is good for YouTube, is that um, they had the trucks loaded, and they were getting on the 401, and Wes Graham said, no, that's not the way we do it at Waterloo. Stop the trucks. And the stop the trucks quote has been told to me by enough people that it's got to be true, including a person who was in the office with him when he said it. Stop the trucks, we're not accepting, and that's a huge donation. And they said, okay, we'll change our policy. Uh, Waterloo's policy remains intact. And with that VAX computer, it made it possible to develop both MapleSoft and the Oxford Dictionary Project, which becomes open text. There were other universities that kind of looked at Waterloo and thought they were a bit nuts, that this was, this was inappropriate behavior, that this was, Waterloo was, was this wasn't ivory tower or you know they had much too close a relationship to industry that uh, Waterloo was was far too cozy with IBM and Honeywell and, and digital equipment and all these other uh, computer manufacturers and software companies that you know, Waterloo wasn't doing it right as far as it was they were concerned although industry loved it when you talk to companies like Honeywell or IBM they they saw Waterloo as as a brilliant place for, for software development. Um, at some point in the 1980s, this, this lower, or maybe even the early 90s, this logo for the Department of Computer Science was created. And there's all sorts of strange stuff on there, including a, a penguin holding a broomball stick. I, maybe that was the official sport for computer science at some point. I don't know. But Across the, the shield is a banner, and there are three segments in the banner. And it says Watt in one segment, W-A-T, and then in another segment it says for, F-O-R, and then in another segment it says ever. And it can be read Watt forever as a celebration of, of Watt for and all that it stood for. Um, uh, teaching, educational computing, entrepreneurialism. The only rule that Lazaridis insisted upon was that it be the best in the world it wasn't going to be second best or third best. It had to be the best, and that's the driving force behind it. Well, you know, if that's the Waterloo motto, to be the best in the world, um, it's an interesting culture shift, saying that, well, maybe that spins off into other departments and other faculties that we have to be among the best or the best, rather than saying, well, we're just a small provincial school. So when people think, oh, it's just Waterloo becomes renowned for computing, it's a simple story. It's a very complex and very personal and very intriguing story.